Good morning, everybody, and welcome to, I should say maybe good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're thrilled you're with us because this is Friday and one of our favorite days for many reasons, but most of all, it's Ask and Answer Day brought to you uh, by our friends and our collaboration with Fundraising Academy at National University. Today, Muhi Kwaja, trainer with Fundraising Academy and the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation is joining us. You're in the hot seat, my friend. <laughs> I know. It's like, woo! You know, uh, Muhi, one of my top 10 most favorite episodes, and we've done nearly a thousand, is the one that we did with you not too long ago um, about the intersection of faith and um, serving a community of faith and what that looks like. And if you have a chance to see it, if you haven't seen it, you should go back and look at it because I just thought it was riveting and really filled with a lot of good information. No matter what you do within the nonprofit sector, I just thought it was really magical. So I wanted to kind of give that a plug. Um, again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and just thrilled that you're with us today. And also who's with us today? are our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. And you can also find us on our new app, streaming broadcasts and podcast formats. We're on nearly 40 different channels. So we go with you wherever you need to go and are there to help you with, like I said, nearly a thousand episodes. Okay, my friend, first question, you ready? Let's do it. We are, Rena writes from Orange County, California. We're starting to fundraise outside our city center and actually visiting donors and funders across the nation. This may seem odd, but is there a way for us to be thinking about regional differences or cultural differences as we work with folks outside our area? It's a good question. Yeah, you know, I really like this. And, you know, I've worked as a one person development team. So I did have to travel across the country and I've worked as part of a national team where I was very much localized to a specific region. Um, but what I can tell you is like having lived in the Midwest in Detroit, having lived in San Francisco and now in Tampa, mm -hmm. Uh, you definitely notice different cultural things. Um, but one of the things that stood out to me was coming from Detroit, Midwestern, very business formal. If you were meeting and things, you may be doing at least a tie, a suit jacket, you know, a combination. But West Coast was very laid back meetings in <laughs> T-shirts, <laughs> hoodies, sweatshirts, polos, <laughs> you name it. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'd seen it all when it came to donor meetings, um, but, you know, holding a standard on behalf of the organization, you know, maybe a branded shirt if it was a polo or obviously if you're out volunteering a t-shirt, being comfortable, things like that. So just being mindful of the setting in which you're meeting your donor. Uh, and I think that a lot of the things will stay true. You want to ask them open-ended questions. You want to get them talking. Um, but in terms of how you engage with them, there may be differences by the region. And if you are going to be traveling out to different areas and you don't have a local board member there or a team member there, um, it might yeah. be interesting how you experience those things. But I would say uh, if you do have colleagues in that area, just kind of get a sense of, you know, what is a typical professional meeting like? Right. I think that's super smart. I, I hadn't thought of that. And Rena, I hope that's really good advice for you. I, you know, I was thinking as I looking at this question, you know, I live in the West, in the desert West, Southwest. And so we take our meetings generally early in the morning because it's so damn hot in the afternoon, sure. right? I mean, our cars are hot. You know, it's hot mm -hmm. to walk across the parking lot, right? For a big part of the day. And so um, it's interesting. We you'll see a lot of donor breakfasts where people go to breakfast and not, 
not lunch or dinner or, or happy hour because it is the heat of the day once you get past mm. three. The other thing I was thinking about in, in my community, um, we have a very, very large LDS Mormon population. And so we don't say oftentimes, let's grab coffee, you know, um, because that's not a part of, of their culture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'll say, you know, well, let's get a nice tea, which is still, you know, kind of off. It's still caffeinated, but do you know what I mean? It, it kind sure. of changes. We're, we're not meeting at like the coffee shops as much as, as, as other places. So I do think this is a good question. I really do. I think it's important to know kind of what's cooking and what's going on. And sometimes it's subtle things, like you said, coming from the Midwest with the tie and the suit and, and people are in hoodies. Okay. You know, it's very interesting. Rena, I hope this helps and good luck because I love that you're spreading out and, and spreading your wings and going somewhere else. Okay, now, now you know, Muhi, how I adore the name withheld questions. And of course. it's like they're the best. And this is not the first time we've gotten this question. We get it. I think a lot of times at the year end or right when people are starting their budgeting cycles. And it goes like this. Can you give me some ideas and on how I can bonus members of our development team? While I don't want to navigate the commission issue, I feel there must be some areas where I can extend additional benefits in response to performance. Please give me some help. I love this. Uh, you know, at the Red Cross, we had performance bonuses. If we had a goal to raise $750,000 from our portfolio. Did we get to 90% of that? There would be a certain payout. If we got to 100% of that, a certain payout. 110% uh, or more of that, a certain payout. And that was also for the regional goal. So was okay. our entire region's goal uh, $100 million collectively? Did we hit that? Did we exceed it? So that's how it was built out. But it was a percentage of your salary that you would receive so mm -hmm. it's not that you're getting you know a piece of that seven hundred fifty thousand that was raised uh just for easy math if you are salaried at a hundred thousand dollars and you had a 12 percent bonus commission you would receive a twelve thousand dollar bonus interesting yeah. so were there any other things like um extra days off or you know like i don't know you know like gift cards or other things that weren't like tax because I, I, this is taxable right i mean when you get right. those, i mean were there was there ever consideration to that or was it just strict like you knew going in mathematically this is how the bottom line would be impacted yeah i did have a very lenient manager that would give uh extra days off or like a work from home day just like you know don't put it on the books but yeah. you know enjoy it you did a great job with getting meetings this week or you were able to um Interesting. push this relationship a little bit forward you know and provide those types of things so i think it depends on manager to manager and the culture of the organization how they do those things for you was it important to have this spelled out and defined so that you knew as where you were going or was this like the end of the year kind of surprise? Definitely on the performance bonus, it was written out. It was clear. You kept track of it okay. in monthly reports. So okay. it was clear what was expected. Okay. Uh, and it was paid out typically in Q4, like early, like okay. October timeframe. Um, so our fiscal year was a June to July. And then in, in October, it was paid out. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because that was kind of like mm -hmm. my next thing was like, well, how, how is this administrated? Like, how do we manage this? And, um, the magic that I heard from you is this has to all be determined upfront in advance. So there's no miscommunication or hard feelings, yeah. or disappointment, right? For sure. Question number two, then, if you left the organization, how did this, how did this play out? Yeah, if you weren't an employee in that October time frame, good luck. You could maybe um, make a case for it and behind closed doors, they would still be paid out. 
but you did see some team members transition after October or okay. during the next cycle, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense. And I I think that these are really, you know, you you start here at this point, Muhi, it seems like wanting to do the right thing, wanting to incentivize somebody, but then you have all these other things that you have to think about in order to administrate it. It seems like we forget those things. Yeah. So having the right measurements in place, agreeing on what those KPIs and metrics are. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they didn't really focus on number of meetings in terms of receiving your bonus, but it was definitely tracked and encouraged um, to get those meetings. And, you know, I've talked to different people at other institutions. Some say it's really hard to get 100 meetings in a, in a year. Uh, others say that's like the golden standard. Uh, and some other organizations set their minimum visits above that. So it's really hard to determine how engaging a portfolio can be and what you base the performance bonuses on. So that's a really interesting thing. And before we move on, you know, you're I'm hearing you say it's not just a dollars metric. It's not just what what comes in during that time frame. It has a lot of other things. Yeah, it could be tied to a lot of other things. Uh, at Red Cross, it was strictly the uh, metric of how much was raised, which I think is uh, a good practice. If you tie in visits to it, it could get tough because not everybody's meeting that metric. And what constitutes a meeting? Is it a phone call? Is it a Zoom? Is it an in-person face-to-face? Is it a response from an email that moves closer to setting up a meeting? Yeah. You know, it's could be a lot of things. Okay, now I'm exhausted. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, I hadn't thought of it in that. Uh, I hadn't, I hadn't drilled down to that level. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, uh, Melissa from Buffalo, New York. Interestingly enough, Muhi is in New York today. Melissa mm -hmm. writes, I know. Uh, Melissa writes, um, are you seeing more people come back into the office or still working from home? We're trying to determine a work policy and it would go into effect at the start of our next fiscal year, which starts August 1st. We believe this is enough time to get everyone on board with the new mandate. We've been having this question a lot in a lot of different forms. And um, I think there was a lot of fear because of the labor shortage and the tight marketplace and people were afraid to, you know, frankly, make their, their teams cranky. And, you know, so what do you say? Yeah, I mean, talking about KPIs and metrics, some corporate <laughs> offices have tied their structures to coming into the office, which is really uh, at the other spectrum mm -hmm. of things. But I think I'm a staunch believer in remote working and that flexibility. Uh, like you said, today I'm in New York and next week I'm going to be in Michigan and I'm not in Florida and our team is based out of San Diego. I'm there a few times a year. Um, but I, at one point I was traveling the world and working, like, I love the fact that remote work is a thing. And I think there needs to be a stronger culture for it. Um, you know, in person is definitely, uh, a benefit, but I don't think it needs to be a weekly thing. I know some that, you know, have to be in the office four times a month right. uh, and they get to choose, do they do four days in a row uh, or when those four days are. Uh, I think all in-person meetings for quarterly or like a team strategy, those things are definitely helpful. Um, but I don't think that a hybrid or uh, back fully in office is a must. Mm -hmm. um, I think that work can be done effectively remotely. We saw that through COVID. Uh, and even prior to that, I've always been remote uh, since like 2018. So... Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for remote, if not hybrid work. Interesting. You know, it seems to me like this, when you drill down on this question or this this sentiment, it's like the older management members don't feel like their, their employees are working, bottom line. It's kind of like, I want to be able to walk across, you know, the office and see people in their chairs. Whether or not they're working or what they're really producing doesn't seem to factor into this. It's more just of like a, how does this look and how do I feel about my team, right? I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing to look at. 
yeah, you know, there's responsiveness, I, I, you know, whether it's Teams or Slack or a text, you know, or a good old fashioned email, um, getting the uh, team cadence and figuring out what works for your team is very important. Um, but I think that in the right circumstances, people can still be very productive in a remote environment, if not just as much. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know that when you and I work remotely and, um, I always think you respond like immediately, super fast, you know, and I know this has been throughout the trajectory of our work together. You've been coming to me from places all over the world and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's it's an it's an interesting thing. I think it's a new time and a new way to be thinking about it. But I do like I do like you, that you know you're going to make this more official and not just play it by ear. I mean, you got to make it understood by everybody. Okay, let's go to Bruce from San Diego, um the home of Fundraising Academy at National University. I keep seeing guests on the nonprofit show and social and across social media using their CFRE designation next to their name. Do donors ever ask what this is? Or is it more of an internal issue within the nonprofit sector? I ask this because I've been pushed by my development director to get this designation. Okay, because you have it next to your name. Yeah, I do, Bruce. Uh, So... You know, I think it's encouraging that your development director wants you to receive it. I think (laughs) there are benefits to having it. Uh, Hopefully it could bring you with a salary upgrade. Uh, And if not, then there are ways in which it makes you more attractive to uh, find other positions because some specifically want a CFRE on their team. I haven't had donors outright ask me what it means, um, but I think in my introductions to them, I bring it up. Um, So, yeah, yeah. Just letting them know my background, you know, where I went to school, what I did. You know, I earned my certificate in fundraising as I am a certified fundraising executive, um, things like that. Just to show my passion for this sector, for my profession. Uh, I think it establishes credibility Interesting. and I've worked as a consultant as well. So in that regard is it, I think it's been really helpful. Well, it's fascinating that you, that you, um, I almost want to say you educate somebody in that conversation to let them know. Sure. Cause once you learn mm-hmm. that, then I would imagine as a donor, you're going to be looking at that profile, you know, a little differently, some other place. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. Well, Bruce, you know, more education is always a good thing. And um, like you said, if you have a development director who's going to support this and fund this. um, Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's 750 bucks to take the exam. So hopefully your development director and organization are helping with that. If not, AFP has scholarships. Okay. Definitely join a study group a uh, frequent guest on this show jack Alato, my mentor uh is hosting study groups all the time so you can have the tools to be equipped to be successful and earn your cfre awesome great advice well bruce i hope that helps and i hope that uh, you come back on the nonprofit show in some form or fashion with that designation that would be cool Okay, here's a really interesting question. It's never, I don't ever remember it coming in, but I think it's going to start to come in more because of what's going on in higher education. Comes to us from Sheila from Chicago. And it she writes, I will be a college freshman next fall, 2024. My question is this: should I enter a nonprofit management program or be a business major? Both programs are in different colleges. And while I want to work in the nonprofit space, I don't want to limit my options. I will be picking out courses soon. I need to make a decision. Wow. Didn't exist when I was in school. Yeah, it's really cool. She's being very forward thinking. Uh, And I would say that, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have an internship in my undergrad that was a development summer internship program at the University of Michigan focused on fundraising as a career. 
Um, and that led me into choosing a master's in public administration with a focus in nonprofit management. Um, so I think that that's helped me in my career, especially the courses around organizational behavior, around accounting and finance and management, strategic planning. Some of those you might find in a business major, uh, but they're going to be in a different context for sure. Which one makes you more versatile? That's a tough question. Um, because if you do want to be in the nonprofit space, I think you'll have value with both degrees. Uh, but maybe if you are thinking about a master's program, you could do your undergrad in one and do a master's in another. And that gives you that flexibility. I love, I love that idea because it would help you. This is the thing that just freaks me out about making a decision when you're still a child in high school, that's going to impact the trajectory of your work life. Right. I mean, and the people yeah. you meet and who you hang out with and how your brain is still developing. And, and yeah, so I like that approach to learning, you know, a broader spectrum and then taking that that second play or second process of a master's program and leaning into something that's more defined and narrowed. Um, you know, I think the thing, Sheila, what's an exciting time is that there are places around the country that are putting forth this type of education. I mean, it's really cool. It's really, I mean, amazing Definitely. movie that we could even have this conversation and even think about this, right? because it didn't exist. For sure. Yeah, really cool. Well, I hope that this helps and and I hope it helps for others people for other folks that are looking at this. Um Muhi, before I let you go, I want to brag a little bit. Um Muhi was quoted in uh Chronicle of Philanthropy about DAFs and your relationship with this this process and this this avenue of fundraising. My question to you is this, which is a little different, but it goes like this. What happened once you were quoted in 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 this publication? Like what went on around you? And, and can you kind of respond to that? Yeah, you know, I think with visibility in a publication like that, you, you know, certain peers reached out, think, you yeah. know, said, congratulated me. Um, and beyond that, you know, I think more importantly, it gave me a boost of confidence. Uh, it gave me a sense of ownership in the space um, to be a respected peer, uh, to also know that the work I'm doing is making a difference. Uh, and whatever challenges and doubts and imposter syndrome that I'm dealing with at different times in my career, uh, to know that uh, I too am somebody of value and importance and in, in the space. Uh, and it's just good to see that small acknowledgement uh, go a long way. Um, so it's kind of given me renewed energy in this space. That is awesome. Okay. That's not at all what I thought you would say. It's better. I love that. <laughs> I really do. I think it's cool. I mean, I was a publisher for 30 years and, you know, I, I did this work and, um, you know, some, a lot of times you never heard back from the people that you covered or quoted. And so to hear that for me personally is just super cool. But um, I got to tell you, our executive producer, Kevin Pace, ran into my office holding this edition and was like, oh, my God, movie questions in here, movies in here. I mean, <laughs> so just in terms of us, we yeah. were like super excited for you. Right. I mean, because. Oh, thank we, you. We didn't expect it. Um, it mm -hmm. wasn't like you promoted yourself out and said, read about me here or there. I mean, it was like a genuine reading and coming upon it. And so it was really cool. And I'm really proud of you to, you know, be included in, in such a, a thought leadership publication. Um, as always, Muhi Kawaja, you're a rock star. We love having you on. Um you're kind of like my where in the world is Carmen San Diego? I am dating myself when I say For that. Sure. <laughs> but I, I, I played the game on floppy disk. So oh. it's, you know, 
<laughs> oh my God, that's great. Well, it's really cool today coming to us from New York, one of the trainers at Fundraising Academy, but more, I think more interesting in, in the things that he brings to the table as a trainer is that he's the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. And you know about community foundations across this world. They've really been a foundational part to American growth and American philanthropic growth. And so to learn more about uh, his work uh, within this very select group of people of faith is, I think, absolutely fascinating. You can find out more about Fundraising Academy at fundraising-academy.org. Um, you can meet the other trainers they have, learn about their projects and all of the different things that are going on in their world. Again, come out to cultivate May 2nd and 3rd okay. in San Diego. Yeah. Okay. We're going to start talking about that more next month, but give us a quick preview. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, tell no us it's just going to be an awesome opportunity. It's the second year doing it in person in San Diego. So if you are looking for a professional development opportunity and want to come to one of the most beautiful places in the country, oh. check it out. And it sold out last year. Yeah, gonna... already halfway sold out already. So tickets yeah. are gone. It's going to sell out quickly. Um, and it's it's just really powerful. Um, we'll be re we'll be broadcasting from there. So yeah, we'll we'll see you there. Um, again, our presenting sponsors are amazing, and they join with us in nearly now a thousand shows. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part Time Controller, 180 Management Group, of course, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these are the folks that join us day in and day out, and they really do work with us and, and row in the same direction with us. And so it's just been a pleasure. Hey, Muhi Kwaja, thank you for your time and your wisdom and, and the cadence with which you deliver it. I appreciate it. Pleasure is mine. Thanks for the opportunity. It's a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we end with this mantra and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Muhi.